Welcome to With One Accord, a brief time presented by the Houston Chamber Choir each Monday and Friday to join us together and to be renewed and refreshed through the power of choral music. I'm April Harris, Manager of Operations, and I'm thrilled to host today's Education Spotlight. Today's episode shines a spotlight on Emily Jenkins, doctoral student, choral conducting intern for the Houston Chamber Choir, and my partner in crime for all education podcast production. Emily has been a shining light in our organization since beginning her intern position during the 2019-2020 season. Her wisdom, leadership skills, and overall desire to just help people grow, learn, experience more through choral music have been instrumental additions to the Houston Chamber Choir. While fulfilling more artistic roles last season, this season's many changes provided a whole new range of opportunities for Emily to grow her skills on the administrative side of running an arts organization. We are immensely proud of Emily's work and very excited to celebrate and discuss her progress as an innovative choral music educator, ready to take on the world with the power of knowledge and choral joy. After the interview concludes, stay tuned for a brilliant music selection conducted by Emily during our 2019-2020 season's Hear the Future Invitational Concert. Enjoy. I'm joined today by a very special guest, someone I'm proud to call my colleague, friend, and in a lot of ways a mentor, choral music scholar, educator, and current choral conducting intern of the Houston Chamber Choir, Emily Jenkins. Emily, thank you so much for chatting with me. How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks so much for having me, April. It's so fun to be a part of this. Absolutely. And you just finished the first half of your second year of your doctoral program at University of Houston, correct? Correct, right. Congratulations. Yeah. How has that gone? It's gone well. Um, you know, the this has looked a lot different than my first year. Uh, that wasn't in a pandemic, but it's still been amazing. Um, you know, I love Houston, I love the university, and I, I love my professors, and I've forged so many relationships with uh, colleagues and with professors and mentors in the Houston area that even throughout this pandemic, it's just been an incredible experience. It's been a lot of work, but it's been great. <laughs> Um, and I've actually already had the pleasure of interviewing you um, the last artistic season for the Houston Chamber Choir. We have a written publication called Choral Notes, um, and I was able to profile you before our Hear the Future concert in January 2020. Um, but for our new friends and uh, supporters that are joining us today, if you wouldn't mind going into a little bit of detail about your background in choral music education and performance. Sure. Um, so I, I'm originally from Mississippi. I grew up in Brandon, Mississippi, and then I was really active in music throughout elementary through high school, played in band, and I was in choir, um, and it became a very important part of my life early on, and I was fortunate to have a lot of directors who gave me a lot of leadership experience, even at the high school level, where they let me take, you know, a section in a room and do a sectional and I could play the piano well, so I would lead things. It was something that I knew pretty early on that I, I definitely wanted to continue. And then I did my bachelor's degree at Mississippi State University. Um, I studied with Dr. Gary Packwood and I did my degree in music education. And uh, that was an incredible time for me. And I, I student taught uh, kindergarten through second grade and uh, middle school. Mm -hmm. And from there, I went straight on to my master's at Georgia State. So that's when I made the move to Atlanta. And um, I fell in love with Atlanta. I fell in love with Georgia State. And I really could hone in on the art of choral conducting. And that's what my degree was in. And uh, I loved my time. Honestly, it was too short. I think I'm a little bit addicted to school, uh, which is good that I'm teaching, but I, I love school so much and I love being a student and teaching students. So I studied with uh, Dr. Deanna Joseph there and I had such great experience um, conducting. We had our own lab choir called the Master Singers and we did a lot of um, choral orchestral works and a lot of things that I'm just so thankful to have the opportunity to do. And being in Atlanta, we also could be a part of the Atlanta Symphony Chorus and go to all these amazing concerts. And there's so much good music education happening there that um, it was just, it opened my eyes to a whole new world, sort of. Um, and then from there, I started teaching in the public schools. I spent um, 
three years, I taught in middle and high school programs. And this and was Atlanta? Yes, it was in Fayette County, south of Atlanta, and then uh, Cobb County, north of Atlanta. And I loved my time there. I loved my students. I think that's probably one of my, I have a lot of favorite parts, um, a, a lot of musical things, but my favorite part is watching my students grow as people, as musicians, as humans. Um, and I, I keep up with a lot of them. And it was just, just watching them from the day that they stepped foot in the room to the day that they leave was pretty incredible. And um, after I taught at the middle school level, I had the great fortune of I was the assistant director of choirs, a visiting position for a year at the University of West Georgia. And that was awesome because that's kind of my dream is to teach at the collegiate level. And I got really fortunate to have that position early on. And I taught um, aural skills, which I loved, music appreciation, choral methods, and then I had the concert choir. And so that was incredible for me. Um, and I, you know, I've at this point, I can say that I've taught kindergarten through college and I love all of them in different ways. I don't quite know if I have the energy to be a K through two full-time teacher. I, I respect them so much, but I, I love the collegiate level. And um, I, after that, I decided to get my doctorate and I applied all over. And when I, when I went to the University of Houston, I fell in love with it. And I walked around Houston, I had a day and I fell in love with Houston. And so um, I started last fall and had a great year. I'm studying with Dr. Betsy Cook Weber and Dr. Jeb Mueller, and it's incredible. Um, and through the connections in Houston and through uh, you know being a part of the University of Houston choral program, I got to be the choral conducting intern with the Houston Chamber Choir, which mm -hmm. was yes. incredible again and uh, has been a wonderful experience. And I've met so many wonderful people and made so many great connections like yourself. And I, I mean, it's just, it's just all kind of a whirlwind of a bunch of dreams that have come to fruition that have been pretty amazing. And now you're also halfway through your second season with the Houston Chamber Choir as our choral conducting intern. Um, last season, you had a lot of opportunities to explore the artistic side um, and conduct performances, um, several other events and activities. This season, you are exploring the administrative components necessary to operate an arts organization. Um, if you can briefly just describe to me um, what that experience has been like, that shift from the artistic to the administrative. Right, yeah. So um, that's been one of the, honestly, the brightest parts to me about continuing to work through the pandemic is finding different things that I can do and that I can control that I still find great joy and that are still very fruitful for people. And I think um, that's one of the greatest experiences about being with the chamber choir this second season is that we've really had the opportunity and I've had the opportunity to broaden what you know I thought of as what I do and uh, really sort of uh, find new things. And that's something that has been a great joy for me. Now, it, it has been a little bit of a shift. You know, I'm, I'm kind of a person that generally likes to keep work and home separate. Um, I like to go home and be home. And now we've, we've been forced for work to be at home. So yeah. for me, I've, I definitely found that I have to keep myself on a schedule and I have to, you know, not get distracted by my home. Um, and so, but with this that we've been doing, we've been doing this podcast and I've been working really closely with you on the educational spotlight and that has just been amazing because we've had a chance to really look for, talk to, promote, and acknowledge these amazing educators um, and these amazing artists that are really contributing to the choral art and to music education. And I think because we've had the time to do that, it's just been something that I hadn't imagined. And it's just opened up all of these new possibilities, I think. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned that um, work life, studying, teaching, doctoral studies in a pandemic. Whew, okay. <laughs> how you? How, how, what do you do in order to focus? What are some of those things that you do to focus? Um, and I'm sure that's kind of where the the love of music comes in as well to help you to keep that drive going. Right. Um, yeah. I think if it was any other. 
thing other than music, I don't think I could do it. <laughs> you know, I think just, just like you said, that passion and the love for education and for music um, really drives everything that I do. And so it makes those sleepless nights easier. It makes them worth it. Um, but for me, you know, I think I, I have to be careful not to, uh, get too narrowly focused on one thing. Um, and I also have to be careful not to like keep too many tabs up in my brain personally. <laughs> I, you know, I make a list and then I just, I accomplish what I can accomplish and, um, that's worked for me. And, you know, I, I'm so thankful to all my professors at UH too, because it's been, they've really done a great job about um, giving us a lot of work, but in a manageable way. So it, it rarely seems too much. And then the work that I've had with the Houston Chamber Choir has just been incredible. You know, especially uh, in that first season, it was different because each week I got to sit there and just hear these incredible voices and watch, uh, watch Bob Simpson just put together these incredible concerts. And then this season, you know, I've been meeting a lot with you and we've just had so much fun brainstorming all of these new ideas and these new ways that we can reach people. And I think both of those things are different, but to me, they're both awesome. And so I've enjoyed both of them. And your in a part of your um, your program at University of Houston is completing your doctoral document. Um, and that's definitely ramped up as far as what you're researching and developing for that project. Um, could you tell me a little bit about what you are studying for that? Yeah, sure. So this has come to fruition recently, actually. You know, we've we just talked about uh, recently how I've kind of just had this, these light bulb moments that have been amazing because for a while I would just, I would have an idea and I would write it down in my phone and then I would say, you know, two weeks later, I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. So it took it took me a while to get there, but I knew that I probably wanted to do something with gender studies. Um, and I, I've i been looking into that in, in a few different ways, but I also really have a, a big love for early music. And so I started kind of researching a bunch of different avenues and read a lot about this one person or this one place. And, and then I came across... Um, what some research has been done really, really recent uh, musicology research on the music of um, convents in uh, early modern Italy. And so that's something that I was really intrigued by because in a period where women were not really singing in the public sphere, all of these women were singing in convents and composing and playing and creating all of this beautiful music that is relatively unknown um, and is relatively unperformed in a lot of places. And honestly, it's not anything that I had really known much about or, you know, not much, our history, our music history texts don't really cover that. And so I started looking into that and a lot of this music is actually published for mixed voices for men and women. And so there, there's been some research and I started thinking, well, obviously men weren't there. So how, how was this performed? And uh, we've recently found out, musicologists and um, some other researchers have found out recently that they would actually sort of transpose and they would shift this music around and basically they would work with what they had. And as a public school educator, I know all about that life. <laughs> you have just got to work with what you have. And so, you know, I found all this music by these women that I could never do with the treble choir because it's not for just treble parts. And so what I'm looking into doing now is taking these editions and creating historically based treble only editions that are as close to we know as how they might have been performed. And so this is really exciting because women can, young women and treble singers can learn about these women. They can, you know, hear the music that is relatively unheard. And they also have a chance to sing this like really historical, valuable music. And I think it's a, a really awesome thing. And I think I'm really thankful to people that have been, you know, kind of delving into all of this. Um, I would love to, you know, go to Italy. I don't know. I've been learning some Italian because a good bit of the language, uh, the literature is in Italian. Right. So I'm doing that as much as I can. <laughs> um, and so yeah, so you are pursuing um, a, a trip abroad to further your studies on this. 
yes, I, you know, willing with everything happening, I would love to do that uh, before my studies are over. And so that's kind of my goal is to learn a lot more about these women and their, their music education in the convents and, you know, how they were making music and how they were teaching each other music. And then also creating these editions that like treble singers can use so they can learn more about these incredible women. So. Fantastic. Wow, Emily. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. And um, so, so I, how do you, where do you look? How do you look? How, what are the first steps in, in uncovering such a concealed part of history? Um, I'm guessing the archives, University of Houston would be a likely beginning step, but after that, where would you go? Yeah, so there are a lot of archives. There are um, archives in Italy that are either in sort of uh, regionally or regional libraries that are close to these convents. They were, the larger the convent, generally, the more musically prolific they were. Mm -hmm. It's not always the case, but especially in ones around Milan, um, we have some around Bologna. So those convents, we have more information. And so we can go into those archives and sort of extract more of that information. Um, and there are some researchers that have been doing that. And then also just, you kind of have to follow, you know, a breadcrumb a little bit. And sometimes it takes you uh, <laughs> in a good place. And then sometimes it's way off, but that's okay because you've learned some stuff along the way. So I kind of started following individual women and then I got to a specific convent. And so then I started trying to see what I could see about this convent in general. Um, and so even looking at non-musical things, like how this convent was being, you know, treated after, you know, historical events tells us about the musical kind of, you know, tangentially about the musical uh, happenings there. So it's a lot of following breadcrumbs, but it's really exciting to me. So it makes it, it's not very tedious anymore. <laughs> I'm looking forward to knowing more about these nuns and this amazing work that they're doing. And I, I always found found extreme interest in the obscure, things that people aren't as aware of, not as mainstream, because that's where the true, the, it's just the, the, the essence of, of enjoyment, experience, life, history are in those moments that we don't necessarily highlight. Um, so I am absolutely just, mind blown, <laughs> really excited to follow this journey that you're on. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's um, so uh, new year, 2021, here we are. <laughs> new ideas, opportunities, goals. Give me an example of one short-term goal and one long-term goal um, you've set for yourself, whether that be with the Houston Chamber Choir, um, your doctoral studies, what have you. Um, I just want to know what Emily Jenkins is looking to achieve in 2021. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think a, a short-term goal, and I think this was, uh, to be honest, it was uh, hard for me at the beginning of the pandemic because I think like a lot of people, I was really disappointed in how much I was losing, you know, um, how many musical performances, how many, you know, opportunities with the Houston Chamber Choir, all of this thing, all of these things that I felt like you know, I was losing, but I found that I can totally find joy in different things, but that are still just as important and just maybe in different ways. And so I think a short term term goal for me is to continue finding joy in those moments of when I think this isn't normal. I don't like this. This is uncomfortable, you know, things like that. And so I think one thing that I found this semester, um, especially with the University of Houston choirs, is that it is still so important to build community. And it's still so important to just, you know, get on Zoom for the 100 millionth time and just talk to people about how you are yes. and talk to students about what's going on, you know. And so building that community has been more important than ever. And I've really found great joy in that. So Short, short term goal, I want to continue to look for those things and really focus in on the, the small joys and the big joys during this time. And as far as a long term goal goes, um, I think 
I really want to make sure that once I get out of my doctoral program and once I'm in life, um, hopefully working as a director of choirs at a university. And, you know, I would love to also be working with a choir or a symphony chorus. Those are my dreams, but I don't want to lose my curiosity. And I, I, this is something that, you know, Dr. Betsy Cook Weber has talked to us a lot about is going down those rabbit holes and learning about all these things that, that are mind blowing and are crazy and sometimes super weird and really interesting. And so I, I don't want to lose that curiosity. And I, I want to still, I want to still be able to learn and to grow not only as a teacher or a musician, but also just as a personal learner. And so, um, I think that's really important to me. And, you know, I, I want to continue to share my knowledge. And, and so one thing I'm really excited about uh, as well, since we're kind of on this topic, is that I have um, been accepted to present at TMEA at the virtual conference in February. And so uh, it's really exciting. I'm, you know, what we've been talking about, I'm sharing some knowledge that I have about early music repertoire for trouble choirs. So um, a lot of what I'm doing is involving these nuns and convents. There is some other music, but I, I feel like, I felt like early music is generally a gap that we have, especially in treble choir repertoire. So I've really tried to find these sort of hidden gems that can really teach them a lot also about these incredible women or incredible composers while really finding great gratification in the music. So. I'm really honored to be able to present that at TMEA very soon. Um, so yeah, I just, I want to keep learning and I want to keep going down rabbit holes. And, um, you know, at 1 a.m. thinking about something really cool and Googling it and seeing if it's true. I don't know, just something silly like that. I think that's, it's always been fun to me. <laughs> Emily, thank you so, so much for this wonderful discussion and congratulations on your upcoming TMEA presentation, your doctoral studies, and as always, I so look forward to working with you um, more um, in the new year. Thanks, April. Thanks so much for having me, and thank you again for letting me be a part of this incredible work that we do with the Houston Chamber Choir. Special thanks to our donors and partners for their consistent support, to our phenomenal guest, Emily Jenkins, and to you, our listeners, for tuning in. And now, please enjoy duet from Cantata Number no. 15, composed by Johann Sebastian Bach, conducted by our very own Emily Jenkins, and performed by the Parker Elementary School Advanced Chorus.
the Houston Chamber Choirs with one accord is your one-stop shop for choral joy. If you enjoyed this podcast, help us to continue our mission to grow the esteem and appreciation of choral music by sharing, reviewing, and subscribing to our content. As a 501c3 nonprofit, support from listeners like you allows us to continue making new and exciting programming. For more information about us and how you can support our work, please visit HoustonChamberChoir.org give.